Hello. Hi. Uh, welcome uh, to Bergen Kunsthal and the uh, Borealis Festival. And to this uh, conversation between Roscoe Mitchell and uh, John McCowan. We're very uh, happy to have them both with, with us today for uh, this occasion and for several other uh, great occasions this week. Um, uh, this event is part of uh, a series of lectures and talks that we do at Bergen Kunsthal called Platform, and today also in collaboration, as I said, with the uh, Borealis Festival. Uh, and it's, a, it's um, on the occasion of the Borealis Festival and also um, in connection to an exhibition that we are showing here at the Kunsthal at the moment called File on the Freedom, which is an exhibition that centers around improvisation in uh, art and music, um, which includes uh, over 20 international artists and in which uh, Roscoe Mitchell is also uh, represented with uh, five paintings. Uh, spanning several decades from uh, the mid 1960s to until up, up until 2021, I think the most recent one is. Um, and these paintings are the first thing that welcomes you uh, when you enter the exhibition, and uh, it's a very central uh, key part of the exhibition. Um, I can also mention that Roscoe, when he came um, this weekend, uh, brought some smaller paintings with him, uh, which are available in the um, uh, Borealis ticket desk. If you want to have a look at those, and uh, unless they're already sold out, they're actually also available. Um, so check those out. Um, um, yeah. Um, I will hand over to Peter Meanwell in a minute. I just also wanted to men quickly mention that uh, uh, after the talk, at around 2.30, there will be an opportunity for a, a, a quick tour of the exhibition with my colleague Hilde Pedersen. Uh, if someone wants to join for that, she will be downstairs in the foyer. Um, yeah. Peter? Thank you, Stein, and thank you to Bergen Kunsthal for, for having us here. The festival collaborates every year, and it's great to be part of this house. And the conversation with uh, Steiner about the exhibition uh, started a long time ago and has been a really productive and interesting kind of way to work together, thinking about these intersections of, of sound and visual art and music um, and improvisation, uh, which leads us to be uh, hit where we are today. And hugely honored to have Roscoe Mitchell here. Um, Hopefully some of you heard uh, Nonea last night for Military Band. Um, the first piece by Roscoe for Military Band, I think, so far, since you were in Heidelberg, playing in the army. Um, and, uh, and it was a fantastic evening. So uh, and that will be, was recorded by Norwegian National Radio and will be broadcast at a later date as well. Um, so we thought rather than, uh, what, who better to invite to have this conversation with Roscoe um, than John McCowan? who sat next to Roscoe here. John was a student of Roscoe's at Mills College um, and is now a collaborator and worked uh, orchestrating and arranging the Nanea piece last night. So two people with a, with a close personal and musical relationship is hopefully the best way to start a conversation. And also welcome to Wendy Nelson, filmmaker and uh, partner to Roscoe, who's helping us with some of the things today, whose films will be featured in a performance on Sunday evening, which is the closing night of the festival. So just to remind you, if you haven't already booked your ticket to come and see Roscoe and John play uh, and Wendy's films, then please make sure you do that soon, because it's going to sell out. Um, gentlemen, Wendy, welcome. Round of applause, please. Roscoe Mitchell, John McCann. Yeah, we're going to be talking about uh, Nonea and some other subjects related to um, composition and improvisation. I always like to start off with a short piece of music. Uh, in terms of Nonea, the way I developed it was I uh, uh, did several different versions of it as a soloist and so on. So I'm going to start off with one short version of an encore from Pori, Finland. Ready? Yes. Thank <laughs> you. 
I've said a little bit about it last night that it uh, was uh, 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 started out to be a, a projection of from five uh, uh, solo pieces for the alto saxophone. Nonea was one of the uh, uh, pieces in that series. Uh, I'm going to go now just to a, a, a bit more music of where the uh, the journey took me uh, after that, you know. Um, the next thing that was in that was a saxophone quartet where the um, the uh, 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 the slow movement reminded me of strings. So I went to uh, my friend Primus Fountain the uh, third, the genius composer from Chicago, and. Uh, I, I told him that, and he said, well, if you did that for four alto saxophones, why not four string instruments? And I thought that was a great idea, and so I did a, ver a completely notated version of that piece for four cellos. Um, uh, after the, the four cellos, uh, 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 the next uh, major arrangement that I did was the trio for flute, bassoon, and piano. So uh, I'll, I'll play uh, a, a bit of that for you now. Thank 
Okay, so I, I've played a few examples of the different things that I've done with the piece, and uh, for the piece that we heard last night at the concert, uh, I gave John several uh, versions and asked him to orchestrate it for the Navy band uh, that, that we heard last night. So um, I'm going to uh, uh, bring John in now, and we can start to discuss some of those things. And and uh... well, uh, one aspect of your work with Nonea that has been very interesting is you know by the point that I've became an assistant to you in these certain situations, uh, you've had uh, 48 years of development with this piece. So from it being a solo exercise for the four registers of the alto saxophone and then becoming a trio, for instance, you having the ability to work on Nonea, like to rehearse it and develop it by yourself for the alto saxophone, then to be able to rehearse the trio version at uh, University of Wisconsin-Madison with their faculty. What was that like, taking it from a strictly solo piece to the quartet and trio situations? Well, um, you know, I had, I had performed it uh, several different times, uh, both as um, uh, a solo and like with the, uh, with, the, with the four alto saxophones. And so, um, I, uh, uh, there's also another interesting uh, occasion for me at the Willisaw Festival uh, where I uh, was there with the Art Ensemble and was asked to play a solo um, for Anthony Braxton, who cannot get there. And uh, I've always believed that music is a science. And so I had my um, opportunity to test out that science that evening um, when facing a hostile crowd there. And um, by, uh, you know, that, that, that uh, uh, first vamp thing that you heard on, on the trio and that uh, playing that over and over again and, you know, uh, uh, changing the, uh, the the way I was playing it, so uh, quieted down the uh, um, uh, uh, the, the uh, hecklers that I was uh, facing at that festival. So um, uh, I, I think that all the things that I did that led up to that moment uh, prepared me for uh, uh, that. And thinking about music as a science, uh, when I was studying with you, one thing you would say to me regularly was that silence was perfect. And that if I were to break that silence, I would need to do it with something just as perfect. That's absolutely true, and it is. If you, and, and, and a lot of people here, you know, may have already experienced that. If you go to a place that's really silent, uh, it is perfect. So if you want to um, interrupt that silence, then you have to interrupt it on its own uh, 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 level, you know, because if you don't, then you're not going to sound that good, you know. Uh, uh, and which kind of like ties into the kinds of studies I do outside, you know, in, in nature. You know, you go out and listen to nature, it's always right. It's always right, so it's the same kind of thing. I, when I was in France, I stayed in the country uh, at a lot of different places. A friend of mine, Limazon, had, uh, and, uh, he was an architect and was working on several people's houses, and there was a, a pond there uh, with all these amazing sounds with the animals and so on. And so uh, 
I, I had a flute made for me by, uh, a bamboo flute made for me by Donald Raphael Garrett, and I would take it down there and just try to fit in, you know. But uh, even at Mills, I had a wonderful experience with one of my students. He really got into that kind of thing. I mean, into the point of just going out into the environment. A lot of things for our practicum when we were studying, when he was studying with me, uh, he would go. He would go on to go outside and. Uh, who knows what he was going to do? He, one time he just climbed up in a tree and so on and all these different kinds of things. I'm so grateful for the time I spent at Mills because, hey, that was, I, that was like a learning experience for me. Uh, uh, and I, I really hit me right in the face when I saw like the students' portfolios and so on that they were doing and all the work that they had done. You know, I, I thought uh, like A.C. Reed, I'm in the wrong business, you know. Uh, I ought to be a student, you know. So, uh, and now I am again. So uh, I, 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 got, I got back to that, you know, because um, uh, with me, I, I'm not the fastest learner, I don't think, but uh, uh, having that, that extra time to where, you know, if I wanted to, I can like play uh, the same note, you know, for a week. And Richard Davis, the great bass player, always used to say, every note like a pearl, you know. You're learning your instrument. You want to uh, know every note on there so it shines like a pearl. And... I remember speaking to you at the beginning of the pandemic and you had said to me that you were going to take advantage of this time and just play one phrase all day. And yeah, I mean, even when you were my teacher, you were always a student by being inspired by just the musical world. You know, whether one week I came to you and you said, you know, I can't put this flute down and then like a month later, you're inspired by a certain kind of music or CPE Bach or somebody like that. I mean, we spent a lot of time playing the music of CPE Bach and you seemed like you were always studying that music as well as music of all kinds of different composers. So, you know, while you were learning that, you were able to teach me about these things. So, you know, I don't think you've ever stopped as a student. Yeah, I'm, I never will. You yeah. know, I, I think I would need a few lifetimes. Uh, I'm I'm taken by that music. You know, I mean the the transversal, uh, the flute that I play. I mean, it's uh, they're able to identify each player by their articulation. You know, uh, it's that personal, and each note has. Um, has its own character and the way you uh, approach that flute. Uh, I, uh, I'm waiting for the pandemic to be over so I can join up again with the winds of southern Wisconsin so I can continue my studies with that. And to expand upon this kind of, uh, one of the main points of your work is this through line of composition and improvisation as the same thing. And as you know, my eyes became more open to this, because when I studied with you, I was still fairly young, and I just wasn't thinking that much. I was just had my head in a practice room. Uh, and then to get to this point where projects that we've worked on together, where you have sent me recordings of improvisations that you have done. And then I take those improvisations and transcribe them to notation. And then I give them back to you. And then next time I see them, it's you know a full score where you've taken one line and taken every aspect of that line and blown it up into bigger proportions. And to me, that's a fascinating and gifted way of working. And I just want to know how that has developed for you and where it began. 
Well, it began uh, with the, uh, the trio recordings on Wide Hive Conversations, numbers one and two, with uh, Craig Taborn and Kai Kanju Baku. Uh, and then uh, uh, I asked Paul Steinbeck, um, you know, to find some people to help me transcribe these uh, uh, improvisations. And uh, uh, that gave me a, a, another way of studying this process. So uh, I, also, I realized immediately that uh, uh, you do it in real time or you can uh, take this, this road and have an opportunity to uh, approach it from something that started as an improvisation. Uh, uh, and 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 that that kind of uh, that that kind of led to the conversations for orchestra, um, uh, uh, where you have a chance to actually look at your process and uh, do it in that way, where you're able to sit at home and develop it in that way, and that in helps to inform, you know, when you're doing it live. Mm -hmm. And. When, when you asked me to transcribe the improvisation uh, titled Last Train to Clover Five, which was a trio with you, Craig Taborn and Kakanju Baku, um, it was, I think, nine minutes and 30 seconds. And I listened to it and immediately thought, there's no way I can do this. Mm -hmm. And as I sat down with it for, I think, over the course of a year and started trying to notate it and trying to notate it, the amount that I learned from attempting to get it onto the page. And then eventually I found that flow. And for instance, learned about uh, simply velocity, for instance, in Kakanju Baku's drumming, where if I was gonna put that on the page, I had to think about things on a simply velocity level and apply what velocity that he's playing at to a certain kind of tuplet. And pretty soon, when I heard it back, I realized, oh, this is possible. And you were able to help me understand that. And so, you know, by collaborating, I've been able to endlessly, you know, this cycle of learning. And it's, in it's incredible what you've been able to forge through this compositional process. Well, it's definitely helped me out a lot. I mean, um uh, when I, I first started to do they they wrote for them um, part one uh, I uh, 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 I took Kanju's drum part to uh, to you know uh, uh, set the the orchestra uh, uh, piece and the way I did that at first was um, I uh, I gave one uh, percussionist in the orchestra his hands and the other, uh, the, the bass drummer, his, uh, his feet, you know. And, um, and then I turned that into uh, an exercise that I, I used on my students out there at Mills College because I asked them to play along with us, you know. And, uh, and when they were there, you know, trying to listen to see what was happening, I said, wait a minute, you're following, you know? And following is like being behind on a written piece of music because you're not there uh, uh, approaching it in the way that you're developing uh, uh, what you're doing, you know, uh, in, in the way that it needs to be. So you're not holding people back. And then when they did that, then uh, all of a sudden they, you know, they, they were in, in time, in real time. You have to be in real time with these things. Other than that, I mean, uh, and, and in the improv classes, just in general, I always would start out with everyone doing a solo so that uh, everybody gets a chance to see who everybody else is. And then the next assignment would have been, okay, uh, select someone that uh, you would like to uh, uh, come back to the next class and do a duet with. 
and uh, uh, be able to explain to the class what it is that you were working on. Uh, because for me, uh, if I don't know what I'm working on, it doesn't inform me. I have to figure that out. And uh, I, I would say that when you do uh, pick something that it is that you're working on it, then stay with that idea. You know, if you were doing it like for, uh, uh, and, and a lot of times uh, uh, people would, uh, uh, and I, I keep a timer with me when I'm working on these kinds of things, and uh, people, they might play for almost a couple of minutes, and then all of a sudden they're exhausted, all the materials. So um, uh, I suggest that if you find something you're working on, it, work on it and get it so that you're getting under the surface of it, you know, because then it'll start to um, uh, reveal itself to you, you know. Uh, and, and everybody struggles with that kind of thing because I do too. And I started doing all of these uh, virtual performances and so on, you know. Uh, uh, I, 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 I uh, played something, you know, and then I'm trying to play along with it, and I found myself up there following, you know. But then when I uh, uh, thought, well, wait a minute now, what I need to do is do this like I do it in real time, you know. If you play something, uh, uh, I, don't, I don't have to put myself in a position of following you. I can, I can uh, keep uh, some of the ideas of what you did and come back to it later. Uh, that way I've uh, put myself in step with one of the very powerful elements of music, and that's counterpoint. Uh, because you're gonna be somewhere else by then, and then I'm gonna uh, take the material, uh, the part of whatever you played, and, and develop that. And then so uh, there we're, we're still moving around in, in, uh, in real time. Yeah. And speaking of being in real time, a few minutes ago you were talking about having students play with the, these versions of They Wrote For Them and things like that that you were working on at the time as the improvising soloist. And I remember a time where when I was your teaching assistant in the orchestration class, uh, I think the class started at 9 a.m. And at 7.30 in the morning I was still asleep and my phone rang and it was you and I picked it up and you said, John, bring your clarinet to class today. And so you talk about being in real time and I walk in the door and you had everything set up and said, John, today you are the improvising soloist with the orchestra. And I had gotten out of bed like an hour ago. Hmm. <laughs> and I start playing and I'm hearing you from the back of the room going, you're not a member of the orchestra, John. You're not a member of the orchestra. And I had to quit thinking, and then I heard you start saying, nice, nice, and I just let it go. <laughs> and that was such a big learning experience within the course of, you know, however long it was, like 10, 15 minutes. Mm -hmm. And, uh, you know, lessons like that, and like in the improvisation class, for instance, one thing I learned from that class with the stopwatch simply was just it brought a focus to us about the elasticity of time within improvisation where it was always a regular thing where you would click that stopwatch and depending on how kind of into the music you were or out of the music like for instance if the music wasn't really happening and I was thinking about what I was going to have for lunch I thought a five minute piece was 15 minutes long. But if I was engaged and following the music and knowing everything that's happening, that five minute piece, I would have said, oh, that, would, that felt like two and a half minutes. And so that was a big learning experience for me about you know, time is not this concrete thing. Depending on where you are within the music, it becomes absolutely elastic. Absolutely, yeah. yeah. Well, you have to be ready all the time. I mean, uh, people have told me about experiences in Cuba. I mean, where you're, you're on alert 24-7, you know. I mean, you might be sleeping and it might be 
in the early morning and somebody says, oh yeah, come over here, we're doing this and that. And I'm fascinated by how they're, well, I mean, they had that uh, uh, in school with me too. I mean, because everybody had to learn like a string instrument and so on and so forth. But everybody learns rhythm and uh, so on and so forth and all of that. So, um, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, and then I'm an army musician too, you know. So like, uh, you're you're on call all the time, you know. I mean, uh, I think uh, being in the army uh, was when I all of a sudden was functioning as a professional musician, you know. Uh, so um, uh, and, and and with the travel and all of that, you know, uh, by going to different places, uh, Berlin, you know, uh, we'd go to Berlin and the band from Orleans, France would be there, Albert Ali was in there, uh, and uh, um, then our band, Heidelberg Usera band, you know, and the Berlin band, you know, so uh, it was, uh, yeah, the army for me um, really put me in step with, with functioning as, as a professional musician. And how was that running into Albert Eiler while in the military band? Well, let's just say that um, I didn't really understand what he was doing at that time. But as a saxophonist, I mean, I can't deny someone with a great sound, you know. And if the sound is there, then that um, uh, uh, makes sense. And But uh, what he did do was when the blues was... Uh, being played, he um, uh, he played the first maybe couple of choruses in a kind of a conventional way, you know, and then he just uh, turned into pure sound, you know, and um, but then we we know of him. I mean, uh, who can deny that composition ghost, you know, and all of those different uh, things, and and it's. It's clear that he's uh, really uh, has a strong foundation going on there. So. And you know, you were talking about well, even with Nonea, for instance. You know, if you look back at kind of one of the ethos of the Art Ensemble of Chicago of this past to the future kind of thought process. Uh, your compositional practice and improvisational practice as equals has been the same way, where always steadfast in this, looking at what you've done, learning from it, and always moving forward. That's, if I can think of one thing to describe your music, it is that it's always moving forward. And that's one thing that I've always respected about your work. Oh, thank you. I mean, but I, I, I have a lot to learn, John. <laughs> I, hope I, haven't, I hope I haven't uh, uh, confused you in any way, you know, because um, uh, that's what it is now. And I'm just grateful, I mean, to, to have all of these ideas right now, you know. So, uh, uh, and, uh, so I'm, I'm, I'm staying focused on that and remaining humble. Yeah. And that's something I've learned from you as a clarinetist. Um, specifically focusing on the contrabass clarinet. You know, I've had so many times where I feel like I've gotten to the bottom of it, you know, where I've hit a wall with it, and I feel like, well, it's time to move on to something else. And then, you know, when I would play for you, you the one thing you would always tell me is, keep working on it, keep working on it. And sometimes I didn't want to hear that because mm. I'd been working on it. Right. But then I'd get past that, and I'd keep working on it, and a new thing shows up. The next thing I know, you know, what was a two-minute idea is a 10-minute idea, is a 15-minute idea. And that's become a, a big part of my process. And I've, and I've learned that from you by simply saying, keep working on it. Mm -hmm. Yeah, that's it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Work's never done. Yeah. The work is never done. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And um, so, you know, you said 
you're thankful that you have all these ideas. Um, like the past two years being like a totally different kind of situation for you. How has that been? Like, you know, I've seen you become an absolutely, well, it was common back at Mills where we'd be having conversation and you would say just kind of off the cuff, I need to get back into painting. I need to get back into painting. And then it seemed like the move back to Wisconsin and everything, all of a sudden I'm on the phone with you and you're like, oh, here's the six paintings I've done today. Uh, you know, you became an absolutely prolific painter in the past couple of years. I mean, you've always been a painter, but it seems like it's been a very intense uh, time for you as like a visual artist. Well, uh, what I do is I develop painting in the same way that I develop my music. You know, um, uh, I, 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 I think long term. I mean, here, I mean, our bathroom uh, at the hotel is amazing to me. It's, uh, it's all uh, black and white squares and so on. I mean, this morning we had some sun, so my wife, Wendy, I asked her to start photographing it, and uh, uh, and this wonderful mirror in there, and then I stood in front of that because I'm gonna try to incorporate myself into that uh, uh, as a self-portrait, you know? So um, uh, 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 I'm, I'm always uh, 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 looking, and, and, and you know, by, by being in it, you know, like you were talking about, by being in it, then, you know, then you open yourself up to uh, uh, receiving more messages because you can't do something that you haven't really spent any time, you know, trying to, you know, uh, 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 pursue it, you know. Yeah. And the more you pursue it, then the greater reward, you know, so. Yeah. But then with, with this painting practice, how is that, informed your musical ideas like one of the new albums you've done that came out last year was dots for percussion and woodwinds mm -hmm. and the painting on the cover is you know it's a pointillistic painting and so there's obviously a connection there between the music and the painting and what from that practice has informed the music well, I mean, you see that here, you know, some of the paintings that I've done here. Uh, I, I, I bring these things forward with me because I don't think that I'd learn everything about them in, in, a, in a short time, you know. So uh, I, I'm excited, I mean, you know, because um, I, I want to go back now and start this uh, uh, new series of works. Um, I always come back with with, with uh, different ideas that I I want to I want to work on. You know, I mean, uh, this like a uh, uh, fascination with uh, this uh, uh, with, with our, our bathroom is incredible. You know, and there's so many different things inside of it. I mean, uh, oh, here's this magnifying mirror sitting on the counter, depending on how you look at it, it then the dots get displayed in different ways. So then uh, I get a chance to experience that in real time, you know, in terms of uh, uh, having all these uh, dimensions and, and, and so on, you know, and uh, having other things play against each other like that, so. And, you know, that, that always inspires me as, you know, somebody who lives life you can have some days where you feel like you're not paying attention to anything. Mm -hmm. And then I talk to you and hear about something that you saw and all of a sudden all these ideas came from this thing. And then I'm like, well, I need to wake up if he's so far ahead with all these ideas. Oh, wow. I'm learning all the time, though, John. Don't, 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 I mean, like, Wendy, I mean, you know, uh, you know, she can be walking down the street at Mills and see something and photograph it, and I think, like, my God, you know, uh, wow, why didn't I see that, you know? So, um, yeah, just being open to learning is, is, is what's helpful to me. So. And another recent aspect of this that, I mean, I'm absolutely just amazed at 
this new process of collaboration which you've came into, which, you know, we're all on stage here, we're all dog people. And, uh, you know, I was raised with dogs, I played clarinet and had my dog Olive sing along. And, you know, your dog Shuggy, you've been playing duo with Shuggy. And this idea of being interested in non-human communication and composition, like hearing the duo of you and Shuggy playing together, I find absolutely inspiring and fascinating. And how did that come about? You just started playing and he just kind of started going along. Yeah, that's, that's right, that's what he did. And like, uh, uh, what I like about him, he's an excellent musician, you know, I mean, uh, when, it, when it's time to stop, he stops. He doesn't like noodle around. If I'm not sounding that great, he's not interested. You know, and he's capable of doing multiple voices uh, at, at one time. And also, um, uh, now I've started to work with him on uh, rhythms and, and different things like that. So um, it's, it's, uh, it's an interesting journey, you know. But I'm wondering, are there any questions from anybody at this point? Anyone? Hmm. Okay, so I, I guess we'll just... How do you work with and rhythms? Uh, what I do is um, uh, uh, I, I experiment with him with different things, you know, because he's, he's very uh, curious about stuff, you know. Uh, I may, like, at first I was working with him on chromatic scales and different things and so on like that. But then I, I, I just started playing these, uh, these rhythms. He's always listening. So, uh, and, uh, and then he's, you know that he's understanding it. I don't get it. I mean, you know, uh, so, but uh, I, um, uh, 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 you know, I, I, I just, just uh, uh, keep inventing different ways of communication, you know, so. Mm -hmm. Am I, yeah, um, I was just wondering, I've seen some of the films that you've been making over the last two years, um, and uh, not only are you playing some of the many instruments that you, you, you saxophones and many saxophones, um, but you're also playing your percussion cage. I wonder if you could talk a little bit about that, because you have this, this uh, the side of your practice that is around percussive instruments as well, and talk a little bit about that, the development of that. Okay. Uh, I would credit... Uh Malachi favors with uh, getting the art ensemble into that, you know, and he called them the little instruments. And uh, so um, uh, uh, we added all that to our performance uh, uh, practice in the earlier days, you know. Uh, uh, we, we traveled around with um, uh, 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 several percussion instruments and um, uh, and our horns and stuff like that. And we had uh, when we first came to Europe in 1969, we took the boat over and we brought over uh, two motorcycles, uh, my motorcycle and Lester Bowie's motorcycle, and uh, Malachi's uh, uh, Volkswagen bus and. Um, uh, we got off the boat there at Sherberg, and Lester's uh, motorcycle, you know, honked out. It was a BSA, and so uh, he jumped on the back of mine, and we drove into Paris. And uh, wow, what an experience that was! I mean, I had never driven, uh, you know, in Paris, and then we're going around the uh, Eiffel Tower, not the Eiffel Tower, but the Arc de Triomphe and all of these different places and getting used to that driving pattern there was uh, a phenomenal uh, experience. But, um, 
Yeah, we we we, and when we 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 got there. We we uh, lived at um, the band lived at uh, uh, Montan uh, Mont Mont Blanc, I think it was uh, Maison Blanc. Yeah, uh, it was uh, the mental hospital because uh, the, uh, the Claude Del Clou, the drummer who brought us there. Uh, knew this uh, doctor that was a trumpet player. And then they, uh, the band was staying there and Lester and his family moved into um, uh, uh, the left, uh, the Pack Hotel in the left bank there. And, uh, uh, but what the art ensemble was, was like a family, you know? I mean, uh, we rehearsed, um, you know, five days a week from nine to five. And no one had to ask, what are we doing tomorrow, you know? So, and, and we did that for like a, a really long time, you know? And the reason why the art ensemble uh, 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 survived, it had to become a cooperative because um, everybody was giving way over 100% of their time you know, to this development. And um, so when we came to, to Europe is when we became the Art Ensemble of Chicago. And the band started out as, uh, you know, bands that I was uh, uh, the leader of. Um, so, um, but what we did was we had a whole plan for ourselves. You know, uh, we would, uh, if we had a concert, we, we had a, 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 a policy that we followed where 50% uh, of what we were earning went into our pot for projections that we wanted to do as a band. You know, uh, uh, we went to Europe, like I said, with two motorcycles and a Volkswagen bus. We left there with two brand new uh, Ford Transit uh, uh, vehicles and um, uh, 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 we got our first uh, um, recording session there with Pathé Marconi, uh, uh, and uh, we immediately got a place to live 18 kilometers north of Paris in saint loup la forêt And uh, so we had our, 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 our ground place where we were at, where we could do our rehearsals and so on and so forth. Uh, 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 the instrument I had at that time, uh, I had made out of wood and so on, and it had a painting on it. And, but then there we met uh, these rod on gate makers, and they, uh, they, they uh, I went over there to them and had them make uh, uh, stands and everything for uh, uh, my percussion instruments. They made this one gong stand that is, what is it, a hexagon that holds one of my uh, uh, larger gongs, and then a, another thing with uh, four things that holds uh, four gongs, and so on and so on and so forth. You know, so, um, uh, yeah, um, uh, <clears throat> and that's the way, you know, that's the way we were running it, because, like, if we did a recording session uh, with, with uh, uh, BYG or something like that, uh, and we say, okay, just give us that van, you know. So, and they gave us a van for for that particular recording session. When we got our new vehicles, we gave uh, uh, some of the, uh, uh, the, the the older vehicle to like Frank Wright's uh, van, you know, and. Um, uh, yeah, like that, like I said, like a family, you know, um, uh, uh, where the main focus was the music, you know, and uh, that kept, you know, that, that kept us in line with what, what it was that we were, we were trying to project. And um, uh, uh, so, uh, and then, I mean, Paris exploded, I mean, when, uh, 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 John uh, Georgia Caracas uh, uh, took advantage of the opportunity of the Pan-African Festival in Morocco and brought all of those musicians to, um, to, uh, to Paris. You know, all of a sudden there were all these concerts and 
uh, uh, recording sessions. Uh, our main venue was the uh, American Center there in Paris, and they had like these practice rooms in the basement and a nice auditorium upstairs there uh, where the concerts could go down. So you had a mixture of the so-called free, but which is, not, I don't know who put the word free on music, you know, because it certainly is not free. I mean, you know, you, you're there working all the time. But, and like people like Philly Joe Jones and Johnny Griffin and Hank Mobley and all of these people, they were right down there with us, you know. Uh, uh, I mean, some of my most enjoyable moments were the so-called drum battles between Sonny Murray and Philly Joe Jones, you know. I mean, Sonny Murray would do his thing and then Philly Joe would just take the sock symbol and, you know, uh, you know, all of these different things, I mean, and then I understood, because uh, I understood, well, I knew that, but I mean, not, not, not uh, as much then, but it never stops. You know, people that are on their music, I mean, they're, they're, they're uh, 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 working on it, and they're, they're interested in uh, uh, different things. So there were uh, concerts that went on with, uh, with them, as well as... Um, uh, 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 concerts on our own too. You know, uh, we worked with uh, Bridget Fontaine there, and uh, also uh, 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 Ellen Silver had this big. Well, the, all of these records, they're out there. You know, I mean, uh, uh, these big, huge ensembles and stuff. The radio uh, was uh, very involved there. Uh, so, uh, and then like. Promoters, you know, and I, I've told people that, like, uh, yeah, I came to Norway too because uh, uh, there was this man here called Helmut uh, who was putting on concerts here. So uh, different promoters were bringing different people around to, to uh, different places. So it, it just exploded in creativity and music and so on, you know. I, I've never seen Paris like that. Uh, 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 again, you know, um, with um, all that energy, and you, you, you never had to go to sleep if you could stay awake. I mean, uh, everybody would go to Montparnasse and end up at the much Metropole, and then by the time you leave there, you just go into the cafe and get uh, a, a coffee and a croissant, and then keep on going, you know? So, um, that kind of thing, you know? But it, it kind of feels like it's coming back to that. You know, this feels like a reinsurgence of, a reinsurgence of the music and where it was in the, in the 60s to me, you know? And uh, so I'm, I'm happy to, to be a part of that. Does anybody have other, any other questions? Yeah, I can speak. I was wondering, do, does the art on, does the art ensemble of Shoki is this still a living entity? Do you, uh, are there plans for further performances? So what is the situation with? Well, basically, it's only you and Don Moyer who, who is left of the original, but. Do they still keep concerts or are planning to do well, so? Well, we did. Our, we had our, our 50th anniversary um, in, uh, what, what year was it, man? 2019, yeah. Because we became the Art Ensemble um, uh, in uh, 1969 when we came to Paris. So we, we had, uh, we did a whole tour of, uh, in the States and Europe and all of that. But then after that, the pandemic hit, you know, where, um, uh, you know, everything uh, changed over into another whole scenario where uh, you had to reinvent yourself, you know, which is a good thing for me because I'm, l I'm learning a lot, you know, about how to negotiate, uh, uh, you know, with doing things virtually and so on, you know. 
So I'm excited about going back and uh, doing the, another video with Wendy, you know, and uh, and uh, 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 so we we just keep uh, we use every opportunity as uh, uh, so, something to learn, and there always is, you know, there always is. There's because we we talk about it and we say, oh yeah, but the next time let's do this and. Next time, let's do that, and so on and so forth. And and I've watched her like grow uh, uh, <laughs> by leaps and bounds. You know, I mean, because now she's uh, like a, 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 a on her way to being an excellent uh, recording engineer, and so on. And and the different things that she does, like with uh, with uh, video and, and and putting it together, and all of this kind of things. And you're gonna see that, you know. Like at, at uh, uh, the the multimedia piece that I'm I'm doing for uh, my my solo, you know, it's not a not a boring life at all, you know. So. You want to say anything? What what, what would you like me to say? <laughs> <laughs> About I don't the know. Video? Yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, okay. if you want to, it's fine with me. Um. <laughs> Well, we, we started this process over COVID of creating videos, um, and the one that is going to be presented on Sunday, can you hear me? Yeah, yeah. Okay. It's a, it's a multimedia video, um, meaning that the idea is that he, it's not complete until he's performing with it. Okay. So uh, it's several layers of video um, that we've developed over a couple months. So I've set up a number of cameras. I mean, I don't, they're not pro-level cameras. Some of them are, you know, it's, one is my iPhone and I've got a, like one 4K camera that I use that I op can operate. It's got a zoom control in it. I've got a, a Blackmagic camera that's in one corner and, you know, it's pretty basic, but um, very, very workable. Um, we, we had, I think one of the most important uh, components of the setup is a like a really good uh, audio recording uh, field recorder. Uh, it's a mix pre that actually gets manufactured right in our in our hometown. Um, and uh, so, getting a good audio recording is probably the the most important part of the process. But we did um, for some of it, kind of an additive recording process because Roscoe, it was really important for him to be able to hear the music as he was uh, performing it. So he was he didn't have headphone monitors in as he was laying new tracks down. Instead, we had a small speaker in the environment and then as we were adding to it, we had to continue adding on top of it, which means that we couldn't, we couldn't take any part of it out without you being able to hear the speaker in the room. So we couldn't isolate anything. So it was a very interesting way to work, but it really worked, I think. We have, so, and there are some aspects of it that were done uh, separately. So they were, um, they weren't recorded to necessarily go into a specific place in the recording. But you know, we were so intimate with the music by that time that, that Roscoe just kind of knew uh, this, this can go in these kinds of parts of the timeline. And so he recorded them, and then, and then we, we laid them in the timeline. And the way I worked is that we, we mixed the audio first. You know, we found out, because we, we had hours of material, and we didn't know what was going to end up in the, in the video. And at the end of it, uh, it was just a matter of hearing it. So we mixed the audio first, and uh, I did it in my v video editing program, uh, Adobe Premiere Pro, um, so that I could see uh, where to synchronize the video. And there's, you know, in some cases, very densely layered video, and in some cases, there was just uh, one or two uh, tracks, sometimes just, just one, you know, depending on... Uh, uh, what we were emphasizing. So, um, I don't know. I guess that's all I can say about it right now. Did you have anything to add? Roscoe? Did you have anything to add to what I was saying? Anything that 
comes uh, up to you about the the recording process? Uh, no, I was, was still working on it. You know, yeah, so. still working on mm -hmm. it. Um, you know, it's it's in some cases complex, but uh, uh, we're, we're learning new ways to make it more efficient as we go along. So it's fun. All right. Very masterfully done. Oh gosh, thank you. <laughs> <laughs> When you're playing to a video of yourself playing, do you ever find yourself following yourself and you have to <laughs> stop yourself? No, I figured it out, you know. Yeah. I figured it out. I mean, like, uh, what I've done is I've, I've gone through this video s several times and discovered several different kinds of ways of playing it and so on. Uh, same with the duet that John and I are doing, you know, we start off with one thing and then gradually build and then we find all the other things that are similar to that process uh, uh, so we can shift the sounds from one uh, thing to the next and so on and so forth. So, um, so no, I, I think I'm, 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 I'm well, we'll see. <laughs> but I, I, think, I, I think I'm pretty much past that on this video, you know, so. But yeah, I, but what I do, what I can do though, I can use my own self as a conductor. You know, if I watch the video, that's uh, something that's gonna strike there, I can get paused and strike with that and add another tone. Uh, uh, with that, if I uh, if I want if I choose to to do that, you know. So, um, but another good thing about to take a note about um, improvising is that if you're coming in when someone else is playing, sometimes it's better to come in on an upbeat, you know, instead of ah, you know. I mean, like there's nowhere to go with that, you know, but. If you're playing something, I, you count. You count just like, because it's going to still work. You know, you count like you're playing in real time, you know. You count, and then you come in on the upbeat, and then you join in, you know. It's uh, all of these different things, I mean, um, uh, uh, that are helpful, you know. What, what will you be playing on, on Sunday night? What, what instruments do you have with you? I have uh, my alto, and uh, I have uh, my sopranino, and of course, thanks to you, we have the uh, bass saxophone, and I have my piccolo and my small percussion setup. Mm -hmm. can, I, can I ask a question? Sure. Um, okay. Do you want to talk about how you create these little percussion setups that, that you can travel with? Because I love that, I love that. Uh, yeah, well see, like, uh, you know, in Madison, there's some really inventive people. I mean, my friend Steven Sylvester, uh, he is, wow, he, he, can, he can turn off his phone and not answer it forever if he wanted to. Uh, thing about it is, is that, um, He's an inventor, and he worked uh, a lot with the developing artificial limbs for uh, 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 with people, and so on and so forth, like that. Uh, if you go to his house, uh, you know he's he's uh, if he needs money, he'll just make some string instruments. You know, I mean, he, uh, in the eaves of his house, he stores all his wood, and. Uh, 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 his environment is totally natural, you know. Uh, he has uh, uh, bat houses, uh, uh, to pile, uh, you know. Uh, uh, what is this? It's Jimson weed that grows in in uh, Wisconsin, and it's a kind of a thing that you can make like a salve out of it and just wipe it anywhere on your body, and it penetrates your body, and you're gone, man. You know, yeah, totally psychedelic, you know. So, but you go there one time and, oh, that was an apple tree the last time I was here. Next time you go there, now it's an apple and pear tree. You know, uh, 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 he makes all of his own uh, tools and so on and so forth. Uh, uh, he's, he's, a, he's an amazing person. 
His problem is, is that uh, he's basically a recluse, you know, and like coming over into my environment, um, uh, he, he had to give, give up some of that, you know, uh, he'd make the instruments and <clears throat> he'd always want them to um, play on their own, you know. Uh, so in the first instrument that he made, uh, 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 he had it on a motor first and he was experimenting with the didgeridoo. Uh, uh, not didgeridoo, uh, the uh, uh, bull roar. Yeah. And he had it on an on a motor, you know, and uh, uh, but then a couple of days before the concert, he decided he didn't like that, and so he changed it over to pedal power, okay. And when he did that, all of a sudden, it started to breathe, you know, because what happens? It may look like somebody's pedaling, in uh, 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 you know, but. There's a, a, a gap that comes in there, you know, that creates uh, the environment for it to, to, to breathe, you know. And the first um, instrument uh, that he made, like I said, was on a motor, but then he put it on, 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 a, on a bike, you know. And the first pellet was on the side of, of his head, you know. And... Uh, uh, he, he then what he was doing was like he had the bull roars on there on a string, you know, and he had some stuff that he can paste them on and then pull them off and take them off, you know. Okay, so that was the first instrument. The second instrument was a whole nother thing. He had this bar that went from the back to the front with these triggers and different things on it where he could let out these different sounds, you know. Uh, uh, he uh, 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 had the uh, uh, opportunity to, to pedal it. And so he not only stopped there with his feet, he put some pedals for his hands as well, you know. And um, uh, the, he took these tubes and cut slits in them so when they were going slow, they were hitting the better together like bells and uh, and 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 the, the whistle sounds that they were making sound like birds chirping okay uh so um he he went on with that and i said he put his uh uh, uh, uh his hands on the front of it with these bigger tubes and so on and all of that the last instrument he made was i i would always name his instruments because he wouldn't bother about that uh, it, it, I called it the wheel, you know, and this is where he's sitting inside of this wheel, you know, where he's taken these brass tubings and made spokes, and he's hanging all of these different sounds, you know, because he, he took me to, like, St. Benny's, you know, and we'd go there with a mallet and tap around on stuff, you know, and uh, so he, he, had, he could go the step further with that you know, by tuning all of his, his sounds and so on and so forth. And, uh, wow, I have video of that. I don't have that on my uh, computer, right? Uh, I don't know. Yeah, because, I mean, you have to see this kind of thing. Uh, but the last instrument that he made, like I said, was the wheel, and we were playing at the Atlanta Arts Festival in Atlanta, Georgia. And he, 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 you know, he, he rolls this thing out there. It's got disc brakes on it and all this kind of thing. And, uh, you know, um, you know, and then our rehearsals were extensive. He'd jump up on that bike and ride that thing for six, seven hours, you know, nonstop, you know. Uh, uh, so he is an amazing man. And I was working also in the company of Dennis Knockbottle, this uh, you know some of these suits you're gonna see on the video and stuff like that. He, he paint he made those for me. You know, and uh, we had like a place in Madison at the Enterprise Center that they gave it to us for uh, a year. You know, so we were we were there uh, working and developing all these different concepts. We did several concerts that included dance, and uh, uh, Dennis made. Uh, 
uh, uh, different uh, uh, costumes and things for the dancers and so on and so on and so forth, you know. So uh, Madison is a very inter interesting place. I mean, uh, a lot, you don't see a lot of people come out, not unless there's something really happening, you know, but then when there is, then you see all these people come out of the walls and so on uh, for that. So, um, and what I like about it, you can really um, establish long lasting relationships with people. And it reminds me of like when I was growing up, you could, you could have that, that kind of thing uh, uh, going on like that. So, yeah, so he's, he's, he's disappeared again. Uh, like I said, he, he doesn't, yeah, well, like he, he doesn't need, yeah, he's, he's, he's really self-reliant, you know. And he used to always ride me, you know, because I was, you know, I, I like these nice cars and everything, you know, and I have, uh, I have been driving like Lexuses and all that kind of thing since, uh, uh, the, the, this 92, they just came to the States and all that in 1990. So, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, he's a, a definitely an a interesting person and a, a genius, you know, and, and Dennis Knockball as well. Did, did, did he make the uh, percussion setups that you, you bring with you when you travel? Uh, no, I make all of those. So you make those yourself? Yeah, just, uh, uh, you know, I had my larger uh, percussion setup when I met him, you yeah. know. So, uh, 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 but but all of these, you know, we went to St. Benny's, and then I, I, so like this one that I have here, you know, it's it's made up of, of found sounds, and it also uh, has a, uh, some conventional sounds on it as well, you know. Uh, so. Um, uh, yeah, I, and I, I have uh, 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 several of them, you know, a, and you'll see that on the video. You'll see the larger one that I have in the basement, but that's not my large setup. I mean, my large setup is out in my studio, uh, 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 which is called the, the cage, the, uh, 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 the percussion cage uh, at the uh, Museum of Contemporary Art in Chicago. Uh, uh, we had a whole setup of the uh, during the AACM's 50th anniversary. We had a whole setup of uh, all of the art ensembles, instruments, and I had all uh, my trios there. Tyshawn Sori and uh, all of these different people were, were in there. As a matter of fact, Tyshawn Sori, once he saw, you know, my percussion setup, you know. Uh, the next time his drum rider was like, whoa, wait a minute, Tyshawn, <laughs> you know. <laughs> so, uh, uh, but, uh, uh, yeah, yeah, so, uh, but, but yeah, I, I, I make several of these things, and I've always wanted to make one that was small enough that um, uh, I could just pull it out of the case and, and it's, it's ready to go, and that's, we're pretty close on that, I think. Uh, with this one, you know, uh, but uh, the, one of the, the best things about it is just finding all these sounds to match together, you know, that work well together. So, um, uh, yeah, so I have, a, I have a, a, a kind of smaller version of that, but on the video you can also see the, uh, the larger version that I have set up in my, in my basement at home. Yeah. Are there any other questions? I had uh, one, um, just going back to, um, it was interesting to hear that two of you in conversation about uh, your relationship as teacher and student and this uh, quite long uh, collaboration, I guess, that you have. And on Sunday we will hear you in performance together and I was just wondering if uh, you could share a bit about how you work together in sort of in preparation for uh, a concert like that, or I'm not sure if you want to share what you're planning to do on Sunday, but uh, how you work together towards uh, a performance like that. Go ahead. Well, you know, I moved from uh, the United States to Iceland uh, about a year and a half ago. And so all of a sudden, I found myself 
musically in a somewhat of an isolated situation. So, um, you know, I really took to, you know, my, you know, we talked about this earlier, this idea of, you know, if you put yourself in, if you have a clear idea, you have to devote yourself to that idea 100% if you want to actually get that idea 100%. So I took that is that isolation and took it as a time to really get as deep into my instruments as I could. And then when I knew Roscoe and I were going to be performing together, I took the time to just experiment with it. every kind of possible situation or you know concepts that I could hear just try to bring everything as close to 100% as I could get just to be prepared for this situation because I was alone. And, uh, and then, you know, everybody's been in a similar situation of isolation, obviously, in the past few years. But then Roscoe and I have been rehearsing every day. And he has saxophones and piccolo. And I brought contrabass clarinet, B-flat soprano clarinet, uh, and bass recorder. And it's been a lot of seeing what sounds work together <clears throat> and, you know, finding... Mainly it's been a lot about space and letting sounds speak for themselves. And, uh, you know, I'm lucky and absolutely blessed to have this opportunity to work on this music with him. And what do you have to add to that? Oh... Onward and upward. <laughs> yeah, there you go. <laughs> Onward and upward. <laughs> hmm. Okay. Um, I think that's about all we have time for, but I'd like to thank Wendy Nelson, Roscoe Mitchell, uh, Peter, thank you very much, Steiner, everybody at Borealis. Um, you know, see you at the concert on Sunday. Check out the exhibition downstairs. Thank you very much. Thank you so much. Thank you for all those insights and stories and just ideas. And I think, yeah, onwards and upwards is definitely the way forward, always learning. Um, yeah, as Steiner mentioned, in starting in 10 minutes or so, there'll, there'll be opportunity to have a guided tour of the exhibition uh, featuring Roscoe's uh, larger paintings um, and many, many great works from uh, contemporaries and peers um, from Scandinavia and in the US. So do take the opportunity to see that show. Uh, and uh, tomorrow evening, John McCowan and Roscoe Mitchell in concert. And yeah, check out the small paintings because it's not often you get the chance to buy a Roscoe Mitchell original <laughs> um, before they sell out. But yeah, thank you so much for being here. Thank you for being part of the festival. See you at the next events. Goodbye. Thank you, Peter. <laughs>